All right, good morning, everyone. Well, despite uh, the snow of last year, so last year we had 10 inches of snow on this occasion. So we basically battled off the snow, and of course this year we were faced with the ice. But with a two hour delay, I'm just really thrilled to see everybody uh, that's here today. So thank you all for taking the time to be here. Uh, CNO and Mrs. Greenert, Secretary Garcia, DOD leaders, Flag and General Officers, uh, senior enlisted leaders, shipmates, and friends. Uh, welcome, we are really thrilled to have you here to celebrate the centennial of the Navy Reserve, 100 years of service to our nation. So again, uh, it's truly an honor to be able to open today's ceremony with the video from President Obama. <laughs> However, <laughs> I do hope that we'll be able to get that for you because we've got uh, <clears throat> We've got a couple videos for you that we're supposed to run, including the president's video and then a video of leaders, President Bush, um, President Clinton, as well as Department of Defense leaders. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to show that to you today. Uh, those videos, uh, sound and all, were uh, produced by one of our reserve PAOs from Atlanta, and her name is Lieutenant Cheryl Collins. Cheryl owns a video production company in Atlanta and uh, has made four videos for us. So again, I'm hopeful you'll be able to see them because they are truly incredible and they really showcase the, uh, the Navy Reserve and our sailors and the passion that they feel for service. So Cheryl, I'd like you to stand please because you did incredible work for us. And I promise you all, when you do see the videos, you're going to be very impressed. So uh, we will have the videos upstairs streaming with sound after this, uh, this ceremony. And we also have a number of reserve sailors who are up there from different capabilities like Seabees Coastal Riverine, the SEALs are up there. In fact, they left, left uh, uh, Virginia Beach this morning at about 0400 to get here, but they've got uh, capabilities set up there, equipment, the EOD folks are there, the aviators are there, so I really hope you'll stop by and talk to some of those reserve sailors and hear about the capabilities that they bring. Uh, so today marks the official kickoff of the Navy Reserve Centennial. So it's not just this event today, instead it's events across the country over the next few months in cities across America. And so we are very proud, all 59,000 sailors in the Navy Reserve are very proud to celebrate the history and the heritage of our service, and especially to highlight the millions who have served over the past century. So I do want to take a moment to recognize those people who have made this all possible. Uh, first, the Executive Steering Group of Transition Flags and Force Master Chiefs who helped put this together, but then the very dedicated Centennial Planning Team uh, including the Navy Reserve's secret weapon, Commander Corey Parker. As we began the initial uh, development process about how we were going to highlight the centennial, Corey Parker was like the Pied Piper, and she had people following her to say, can I help with the centennial? So it really is an amazing team of talented sailors and civilians who have volunteered to put this all together. So I do want to thank all of them and salute them for their dedication and hard work to this point. To the hey, color Corey guard. Just in. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> and to the color guard and our Navy band, thank you all for being here. You all are brilliant as always. And of course, Chaplain Kibben, thank you so much for doing the uh, the invocation for us today and for your leadership of the Chaplain Corps as well. We have a number of special guests in the audience that I'd like to recognize today. I'm especially honored to be able to welcome three of my predecessors, former Chiefs of Navy Reserve whose strong leadership was really critical to building the force that we have today and to meeting the challenges that uh, the Navy Reserve faced after September 11th, 2001. And though they've taken off the uniform, they all continue to serve in so many ways, supporting the Navy and our sailors. 
And so with over 100 years of service between the three of them, I'd like to recognize, would you please stand, Vice Admiral John Todeshek, <laughs> Vice Admiral John Cotton, and Vice Admiral Dirk Reddy. What incredible contributions that they made and what incredible mentors to me throughout the year. Thank you, the years. Thank you all so much for everything you do. So we all know that chiefs are the backbone of the Navy. And so we know that chiefs are laser focused on getting the mission done and taking care of sailors. And so we are very honored to have seven of our former force master chiefs here with us today. And we, were, uh, we had a great time, we had an event last night, we had dinner for all of them last night and the former Chiefs of Navy Reserve at the house last night and got to meet and talk with some of these uh, just inspirational Master Chiefs who, who have come from long distances to be with us today. So I want to recognize, would you please stand as I call your name, uh, Force Dick Johnson, Force One, uh, Joe Lally, Larry Sorensen, who was my Master Chief when I was a Lieutenant in the Navy Reserve. <laughs> Uh, Chris Glennon, Dave Pennington, Ronnie Wright, and representing Chris Wheeler is his son, Brandon Wheeler. Brandon, would you please stand? <laughs> and I also want to recognize my Force Master Chief, C.J. Mitchell, who is just absolutely incredible. Force. And finally, there's two special guests here today who really embody the uh, service and sacrifice of Navy Reserves over the past century. And so please join me in welcoming two distinguished World War II veterans, Dr. Phil Lundberg and Lieutenant Commander Dan Siegel. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us today. The history of the Navy Reserve is a proud legacy forged by dedicated men and women who, when, when duty called, were willing to leave their homes and families, their civilian jobs and communities, and go in harm's way to serve our nation. Even before the Navy Reserve's founding in 1915, there were men and women who served in naval militias around the country. But by the beginning of World War I, a young Assistant Secretary of the Navy uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, you may remember that name, saw a need to establish a federal maritime reserve force. And he urged Congress to en enact uh, legislation to establish that Navy Reserve. And so on March 3rd, 1915, the United States Naval Reserve was officially established. And by the end of World War I, over 250,000 reserve sailors were serving. So in a matter of about two years, 250,000 were serving. During World War II, the Navy Reserve was uh, grown even larger, and of the 3.4 million sailors in the Navy who were serving, 84% were in the Navy Reserve, including five future U.S. presidents. Last month, we were honored to receive a letter from President George Herbert Walker Bush and it was dated February 2nd, 2015. As you may remember, President Bush served in the Navy Reserve during World War II. He was a naval aviator in the Pacific where he, he earned the Distinguished Flying Cross and numerous air medals. In 1944, after his aircraft was hit by enemy fire, Lieutenant J.G. Bush and his crew members were forced to bail out of their aircraft and ditch into the sea. As the only survivor, and after four hours, then Lieutenant J.G. Bush was re rescued by the crew of the submarine USS Finback, hence his abiding appreciation for the submarine service. <laughs> I'd like to read... <laughs> I knew you'd like that scene. <laughs> so I'd like to read a portion of President Bush's letter to you, and I quote, Dear Admiral Braun, I'm checking in to offer personal good wishes and congratulations to all my fellow Navy Reservists on the occasion of the Navy Reserve Centennial. What a marvelous milestone. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, I was a senior in high school. 
I knew then that I'd enlist in the Naval Reserve just as soon as I graduated, and I did just that on June 24, 1942. And I count my experience in service among the most rewarding and inspiring of my life. And I cannot tell a lie. I also experienced some of the scariest moments of my life as well." End quote. President Bush also closes with, Barbara and I salute these patriots, past and present, and we pay special tribute to those who made the ultimate sacrifice for freedom. The letter is signed, G. Bush, number 41. So today we salute President Bush and all the millions of brave, and brave men and women who served in World War II and all of the conflicts and contingencies since then. From Korea to Vietnam, from the Gulf War to Iraq and Afghanistan, and in all the contingencies like Katrina, Haiti, and Tomodachi, Navy Reserve sailors have been there, and they continue to be there today as about 2,000 of our Navy Reserves are forward deploy deployed overseas, providing critical capabilities and support to the Navy and truly making a difference every day. So today, as we salute Navy Reserve sailors, past and present, we also take a moment to look to the future, knowing that the current generation of sailors are ready now to serve any time and anywhere the Navy needs them. So now it is my great honor to introduce our, our guest speaker, Admiral Jonathan Greenert, <laughs> the 30th Chief of Naval Operations. A graduate of the United States Naval Academy, Admiral Greenert has successfully commanded at all levels including the USS Honolulu, where he earned the Vice Admiral Stockdale Award for Inspirational Leadership, Commander Submarine Squadron 11, Commander Naval Forces Marianas, Commander U.S. 7th Fleet, Commander U.S. Fleet Forces Command. In his last tour, he served as the Vice Chief of Naval Operations. We're very privileged to have him with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Admiral Green. This is quite a dance partner, isn't it? <laughs> I, we were talking here. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the agenda for your celebration, but it's extraordinary. It, it is astounding. And I said to Robin, if this is the only thing that doesn't go exactly as you want, with all the stuff you got here, you have one hell of a celebration coming up here. So uh, enjoy it. Um, I, I would, uh, that, that uh, letter that, that Robin read uh, from, from President Bush, pretty heartfelt, isn't it? Uh, I really commend the book that, I, I'm not getting anything from this, but I, my, son, <laughs> my son bought me the book by his son, uh, George W. Bush, and it's really good, and it, it explains why uh, George Herbert Walker Bush would write such a memo to, to uh, Admiral Braun for something like this, so uh, I give you that. I was taken by 100 years of service, my gosh, my mentors, <laughs> and they're over here, and Todeshek is mouthing, cotton served 90, I served... <laughs> I served five, and, De and Debbie said, no, I only got three, give two to Braun, you know? And that, is that like they're a team? They always stick together. It's uh, just like them. So uh, I'm always amazed at the talent that we have in the Navy, uh, the, the Navy Reserve, actually, in there. I mean, we have Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Juan Garcia here, who is also in his own words, the best bass guitarist that this country has ever known. He taught, he says he taught Paul McCartney. How to, how to, now, I don't know if that's, no, that's not true. Of course it's not true. Of course it's not true. Well, anyway, uh, I'm honored to be here. And give yourselves a hand for 100 years, because it ain't going to happen all that often. Give yourselves a hand. You've you got to grab it. I want to take just a few minutes to talk about uh, where I see the Navy Reserve in my Navy today and a little bit about what they do values-wise, where they kind of fit in. The, uh, as Robin said, and it's true, I, uh, growing up through the Cold War, serving through the Cold War, I should say, I've seen the Navy Reserve kind of go through uh, a group of, one day we may need them, let's hold on to them, that's our strategic reserve. So when the Soviets go you know, across the Florida Gap, we're going to need a call on them to keep things going, so hang on to them. To, well, they're all right. They come in every now and again to the unit. To, okay, just don't, just don't clobber with them, you know, keep them separate. So I guess we would call that 
uh, tolerance, for lack of a better term, to integration, to addiction, and Desert Shield, <laughs> Desert Storm. What are we going to do without these people to, really, frankly, total integration today? They're here. They're all over the place. I, I just kind of casually mentioned the different skill set. Uh, as I mentioned, even a musician, no kidding, he is a good uh, bass guitarist. But it is the bass guitar, isn't it? Play it all. All right. <laughs> hey, go with me, huh? To, to the skills that are out and about in the community, as our world, as our requirements evolve in the Navy, in the armed services today, you know, to be able to reach out and pull that in quickly is incredibly valuable. And I think, I think you all know what I'm talking about. The reserve sailors, as they say, they punch way above their weight. 12% uh, of our force, 6% of our budget. That's a pretty good deal. And any kind of corporation out there, if you could do that and to get that kind of output, you're doing well. Since 9-11, I think Robin alluded to that, 73,000 mobilizations. So you go back to the early days and we say, yeah, one day we may need these folks when the big one comes up. Well, the big one's been up all around and we've needed the Navy Reserve left and right all the time. So you're there. The sacrifices, I've never really understood the sacrifices uh, that you all go through, but it is extraordinary. As I've grown up and learned to kind of get to know you all and serve with you, uh, what you give up, uh, careers on hold, short notice deployments, and you say you're ready to go, and then of course something happens overseas today, and we say, guess what, we don't need this billet, this individual augmentee, you're out. Yet you tolerate it, you come back, you buckle up, and you're ready to go again. And to me, I find that extraordinary that you're willing to do that for not a lot of money, and it's, uh, I think it's obviously just for what you enjoy and your service out there. And I thank you for that. No guarantees. Citizen sailors, and you're in every domain. I go around the world today, Darlene and I travel, go into a, a theater ASW center, and it's populated a good percentage by reserve officers and enlisted there taking care of business. It's on the surface, it's in the air, it's in space, and it's in cyber, big time, big time. We would be in big trouble uh, were it not for what we get out of our the reserve forces and our cyber sailors. It's a float and it's a shore, and that's a good thing as you're able to go back and forth. And, and the innovation that you provide, that you, that you feed our Navy, again, in a rapidly moving and cycling situation that we're in today out and around the world is amazing. It's a diversity. It's, it's the, the, the concept of, of diversity, what you feed us professionally, geographically, uh, mentally out there is astounding and we thank you. The, the, just look at the agenda for this celebration. I mean, I'm trying to imagine uh, me getting the board of directors and say, okay, you know, we're going to have a celebration and get that kind of, of uh, well, innovation, those kind of different <laughs> ideas going on. Bottom line is I couldn't get on Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> I can't get on the Today Show. Look at that. So I don't get it, but I'll ride it. <laughs> You wear my uniform, that's good for me. You're a Navy, I like that. The skill sets and the capabilities have become more mature as time goes on, uh, and there's nothing like it uh, in any other corporation out there. And we have leveraged you uh, to the nth degree and will continue to do so. I have, uh, since I've taken the watch, a long time now, I had six words that I thought really were important for us as we move forward in our challenges. Number, the first two words are war fighting is first. And the Reserve Force has done a, a, a wonderful job in that regard. In fact, embraced it. Today, out in the Arabian Gulf, we have the good ship Ponce. It's a USNS. But if you go out and you visit or you look at what the Ponce is doing, she is out there testing new weapons and new concepts. As we say, getting it wet. A lot of reserves on there. A lot of folks, in fact, it's been predominantly the support of the reserves and the individual augmentees that has made that happen because we thought of it, John Harvey and I thought of this like shortly after I took the watch, and we've had tremendous payback. We have uh, Riverine out there getting it done, protecting our ships coming in and out, Suez Canal, you name it. A lot of that provided by reservists who go out there and get the job done out there. And I mentioned Cyber Force. Today, they're up there at Fort Meade, they're out there at Niox from San Antonio to, to Georgia, around the world, and our networks are being attacked. And they're pairing the blows, if you will, and finding out who's doing that and turn this thing around. We're fighting first. You get it. You get it a lot. Operate forward. As I just mentioned, the Ponce out there. You have an expeditionary electronic attack squadron on deployment. High value escort, which is really making sure our SSBNs get to sea and back on time 
and lots of other transits through the Arabian Gulf, the Strait of Hormuz, the Suez Canal, all that, that I mentioned, out there operating forward, not to mention logistics. Our logistics are almost solely dependent upon our Navy Reserve. And our logistics are darn timely, and we get it done right. And lastly, be ready. In this turbulent world, again, as things happen so quickly, the Ukraine situation, Iran, the Iraq situation, Syria, where do we turn quickly when we need to help the joint force? We turn to the reserve force for individual augmentees. We say we need planners. We need logisticians. We need medical planners. And we, where do we get that? We can't just pull it. The, the active force can't respond that quickly. You do it. You did it, you did it through entire 13 years of war in the, in the Middle East during this last period. You are ready and you have been ready. I missed the Ebola outbreak. Reserve Force, major part of that as we completed that successful operation. So while the future operational demands are unknown, I'm sure glad we have you in our force, in our Navy, taking care of us and making sure we can respond. I congratulate you. Embrace this period of time. It only happens once every 100 years, right? <laughs> so embrace it uh, and think about the uh, great heritage and the great legacy you have.